we're just going to give it a couple of minutes just before we start to let everyone filter into the webinar. Sometimes it just takes a few minutes for yeah. it to let everyone in. I've seen a couple of people go in and out, so there might be a, a few wee connection issues, but we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Just while we're waiting, um, I'll let everyone know that your camera is disabled and so is your microphone. So hopefully you can hear um, hear us today, but we won't be able to hear or see you. But if you'd like to communicate with us, then you can absolutely absolutely do so through the, the Q&A function, which is just along the bottom. So if you take your mouse and just hover towards the bottom of the screen, there's two wee speech bubbles that say Q&A you can type a question to us in there. We'd be happy to take questions throughout the webinar um, and we will specifically leave time at the end for questions. So I think we can probably go ahead and get started now. That's a couple of minutes have passed. So anyone who joins us later, I'm sure they can catch up. So welcome everyone to um, our applicant event for the BSc in Psychology and Counselling at the University of Strathclyde. So my name is Leah O'Neill and I work within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences as a Student Recruitment Officer and I'm joined here today by um, Steve Kelly who is the course leader for the, the BSc programme. Um, so we're just going to go through a couple of slides with you and as I said there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. If you do want to ask a question you can do so using the Q&A box which is just along the bottom. Please don't be shy, happy to take as many questions as anyone has. So you can ask them throughout the presentation or wait until the end, it's entirely up to you. And I'll pass over to you Steve. Thank you very much Leah and good afternoon everyone. And thank you so much for coming along to this presentation on our applicant day. Uh, my name is Steve Kelly. As Leah said, I'm the course leader for the Joint Honours Psychology and Counselling programme. I've been a cognitive psychologist for coming up for 30 years professionally, uh, way back in my research assistant days at Aberdeen, up to being a, a senior lecturer here at Strathclyde. And more recently, I have taken a, a counselling pathway. I'm a qualified person-centred counsellor, as well as teaching on the counselling skills course, the joint honours course. I also have my own private practice uh, in counselling. So what I'm going to do is just try and introduce uh, the joint honours programme to you, what you might expect uh, in the years one to four, what you might get out of it personally, and where it might allow you to carry on to in terms of both a career, but also in sort of personal skills and qualities. So I'm just going to share some PowerPoint slides with you, first of all. I hope everyone can see uh, those. And then we have a nice view of uh, the city of Glasgow, uh, from probably a view you will get from where we sometimes have our classes in the Livingston Tower. We're usually on the eighth floor of the Livingston Tower in third year. So we get this lovely view over the city itself. I know you're interested in coming to Strathclyde, so I thought I'd just uh, have one side about why you should really consider as, as a serious option, your first choice. Um, first of all, we have a BPS accredited degree. So because it's a joint honours, half of what you do will be psychology. And that psychology course is uh, taught by the same people that teaches the BA single honours psychology. You'll be sharing many classes with the single honours psychology students. And at the end of your fourth year, you will have undertaken a dissertation uh, and you will have the ability to join the British Psychological Society as a student member. Uh, that gives you graduate basis for chartered registration, which means you can go on to train further as a professional psychologist, should you wish to do so. Of course, that accreditation from the British Psychological Society is also a bit of a gold standard badge because they visit um, every so often. We had our last accreditation visit actually just over a year ago, and there they check to make sure that we have all the, all the facilities that you would need 
to undertake a, a robust and comprehensive psychology degree. So books in the library, journal availability, laboratory space and types of different labor laboratory, as well as appropriately qualified staff across all areas of psychology and technical assistance uh, as well as secretarial assistance. So we have all that and that gives you that British Psychological Society accreditation at the end of the joint honours. We are dual accredited however. COSCA is the governing body in Scotland uh, for counselling. Uh, I'm a member of COSCA, I'm also a member of the British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy. So at the end of your level three in this programme, you will be awarded the COSCA uh, Validated Certificate of Counselling Skills. That is the usual qualification you need to go on and train uh, on a professional course to be a counsellor. And of course, because you have the counselling skills and the certificate, because you have the BPS accredited degree, you can go on to train to be a counselling psychologist. It's the perfect pathway for that. But of course, you can train to be a counsellor as opposed to a counselling psychologist, or get a clinical psychologist, forensic psychologist, or just use your degree in any other sort of helping or managerial profession you want. You're going to be trained in key research and analysis skills. So these are very useful, obviously, within science. Many different types of career that will ask you to analyse complex data sets. All our counselling tutors, uh, myself, and I'll introduce you to a few others as well, we all undertake regular client work. So it's not just ivory tower theory that we teach. We will be talking about, uh, in confidence of course, and not disclosing any identities or specific information, but we'll be talking about some of our client work to illustrate some of the, um, some of the skills uh, and some of the utility in the, the attributes that we'll be kind of asking you to find in yourselves, show you how that actually works in practice. The curriculum of our BSc has been developed to provide an experience that's going to be quite similar to that on a professional counselling training course. So we've introduced supervision groups. As a qualified counsellor, I have to go and see a supervisor every um, so many hours every month. And that's to ensure that my practice is safe and ethical and I'm uh, staying safe and well in, in, in dealing with the things that I hear. Now, you usually get put into supervision groups while you're training to be a counsellor. Because you, you will be doing some listening work, uh, both at level three and in your fourth year in placement, we've introduced these supervision groups to try and uh, emulate the professional practice that goes on there. We also have large group work, uh, which is a feature specifically of person-centred uh, psychotherapy. And I won't tell you too much about a large group, but really it has no agenda we meet and we just experience one another. We get to work out what's going on for us. And that helps in our training to understand someone who we may be listening to in some sort of professional or helping capacity. Another thing I'd really like to emphasize, and it's something we get year on year from BA Psychology National Student Survey, is the uh, support that's given to our students. We've got an open door policy for academic or personal issues. Some um, organisations may have office hours, you have two hours a week where you can go and see a lecturer. Uh, we don't have that. Anytime you need to see us, you can email, we can, you can make an appointment. Um, and we have specific class leaders, year tutors as well, who are first points of contact should you be experiencing any difficulties or want any particular type of advice. So as I say, our students find us really, really approachable. It comes out every year in the comments from the National Student Survey and we're always open to, to more ideas. In fact, this year's fourth year, because we've had such a difficult time with COVID, quite a few times during the year they've emailed me and said, Steve, can we just get a group together? Because we're missing each other. You know, we want to just chat about how the course is going in and chat about, you know, just general stuff going on in our lives with lockdown. And we, we arranged that over Zoom. Uh, we had a, a small Christmas party, in fact. Um, so it is a very friendly, a very welcoming uh, course, and a very supportive course. There's four main tutors on the BSc. You will, you will encounter many, many more people on the psychology side uh, of the degree. But in terms of the, the counselling tutors, I have space for the four of us, the, the teacher. And there's myself, of course, I'm the course leader. As I mentioned, I'm a cognitive psychologist and also a person-centred counsellor. In psychology, you will encounter me teaching um, things including memory and learning, uh, face recognition, 
I teach a bit about consciousness at level one. And a fourth year option I do is on psychology of religion as well. So quite varied uh, interests in terms of research. Katie MacArthur, she has a PhD in counselling. She trained at Strathclyde and she's the author of a, a textbook called The School-Based Counselling Primer. So Katie's a really expert in counselling children and young people. Uh, Dr. Ji Lu, a colleague of mine in psychology, he's also a qualified counsellor as well as a developmental psychologist. Ji teaches positive psychology and also cross-cultural psychology. And he's got some very specific interests in mindfulness. In fact, he's currently doing a master's in mindfulness-based interventions at Oxford University. Uh, and he also does Tai Chi, he's a Tai Chi instructor and he brings that into some of his lessons as well about the, the benefits of, of Tai Chi. And someone I work really closely with, uh, someone actually who taught me counselling skills, Malcolm McMillan. Uh, Malcolm is a person-centred counsellor. He's also a qualified supervisor. He supervises other counsellors uh, in his private practice, of which he has got very extensive experience. He's also additionally trained in relationships, couples counselling, and also in children and young persons counselling. So Malcolm brings a wealth of experience uh, to the team from many different areas within counselling. Um, what is special about our course? It's been designed to allow you to go into training in psychology, into counselling, or you know, the marriage of the two, counselling psychology. And you're taught by a range of professionals from each of these. I won't read out all the, the text here, but you'll see there you're going to get a huge gamut of skills. You're going to be trained to a very high level by the time you leave us in fourth year. The psychology skills, the scientific skills are very valued. Uh, we have a dissertation prize, in fact, uh, from KPMG, uh, who's a big sort of management consultancy and accountancy firm. They specifically targeted our psychology students because they had lots of accountants, but they wanted people with very good um, people skills, which our graduates do have. In addition, as you are counselling and psychology students, you're going to acquire even more active listening skills that will be useful in many fields just outside therapy, in any caring work and managerial work to show that you can listen to your employees and in your personal life as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, the various elements that we put into the counselling class, these we consider are perfect foundations for going on to professional training as a counsellor. And as I've already mentioned, they're going to include some of the same things that you will experience on professional training courses. So you will go into those courses being a little bit familiar with them already. Uh, assessments during the, uh, the degree, these are very varied. Uh, they will tap your skills in many different ways and really allow you to speak to your strengths because everyone prefers one type of assessment over another type. They can range from theoretical essays to lab reports, are usually exams, but also and particularly within uh, the counselling aspects, personal reflective essays on how you think you've been changing or how you think you've been using your skills, either in your work at university or in your personal life. And also with the counselling skills, we will ask you to record uh, a short piece of you actually working as a, as a listener uh, with someone else telling you about their issues, another classmate, and you will um, provide a transcript of that and reflect on everything you said. Was it helpful? Was it not? Could it have been better? Um, I've mentioned already the course is dual accredited, so you come out with both a British Psychological Society accreditation but also that COSCA accredited certificate in counselling skills. And you can join the BPS uh, as a student member after that. You can join COSCA as a counselling skills member once you have their certificate. So how is the course structured? At level one, um, you'll undertake the same uh, course as someone coming in to do the BA psychology. So you're actually doing uh, what all the humanities and social science students do. You'll do 40 credits in psychology and you'll do 80 credits in two other subjects from somewhere in the faculty. So that won't involve counselling, that starts at level two. But you can choose anything that you might uh, find interesting such as education, law, languages, politics, um, and at any point you can switch from the BSc onto the BA uh, uh, after first year. At level two, uh, and from then on, half the classes you will take will be in psychology 
and half the classes you take will be in counselling. Although, of course, there's going to be quite a bit of um, overlap between the two. The two semesters that we have run from September to December and January to March. Lecture times and hours vary across the, the year, uh, across years, year groups for all of these. But exam periods are in December and May to June. Although there are some coursework assignments during semester, and it's not the case that every class always has coursework and an exam. Some classes are assessed by both. Some are assessed by only coursework. Some are assessed by only exam. And the nature of those assessments, as I mentioned, can, can vary quite consider considerably. Uh, we will communicate mostly with you through uh, our MyPlace system, our virtual learning environment. So we stay in close contact with students, um, giving our information and class information via email messages. But actually, and particularly on the counselling aspect, we regularly meet our students face to face. Um, even during the pandemic, where it was possible with our third year who are involved in um, real experiential learning, we felt it was so important to work in groups that we that we made sure everyone was safe, but we, we, we came into the university um, before Christmas and worked face to face. We were one of the very few subjects that were um, willing and able to do so because we felt, we felt it was so necessary. Um, and all our students say that they, they really get a lot out of that group work, that coming together as a small class. The class is limited to somewhere between 20 and 30 students per year, uh, unlike in psychology where you know, we, have, we have many hundreds of students um, across the years. There are your tutors both in the counselling side and in the psychology side and they are your first point of contact. If you've got any difficulties at all, that's where you can get advice from um, in terms of support services within the university, but also how things work in terms of extensions or, or study skills. So as I mentioned, level one is, is a BA um, general first year in, in Scotland. You'll do psychology and two other subjects, which hopefully will be of, of interest and use for you. The level two in psychology, you'll get a broad and more detailed view of psychology topics. And this is where our counselling classes begin. So in counselling, we cover positive psychology. This was um, developed really by, by Martin Seligman. He was one of the, the big um, depression uh, researchers in the 1970s. Uh, but Seligman came up with this realisation that a lot of clinical psychology was all about what's wrong with people. Um, diagnosis uh, and um, deficits and actually psychology has got a lot to offer in terms of the positive nature of things so even in terms of trauma uh, good things can come out of trauma there can be post-traumatic growth and learning so positive psychology covers that sort of idea you'll undertake theories of counseling and psychotherapy which will give you a very broad introduction to not only person-centred approach, which we concentrate on in Strathclyde, but psychodynamic, CBT, and even some of the more um, unusual ones like uh, Gestalt or transactional analysis. And we also cover professional issues there, uh, such as ethics and self-care. And the third counselling um, topic that you'll get in second year is uh, a general introduction to mental health issues. So schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, eating disorders. We'll be having a look at those and seeing how psychology, and clinical psychology views these, but also how to think about how we view them within uh, counselling and particularly person-centred counselling. Level three, this is where we're going to take half of the required British psychological core areas. We have to cover six core areas plus a dissertation to have that accreditation. So we cover three of these at level three. Those are research methods where you'll focus on how you set up a scientific study, how you analyze your results. And we use both numbers, quantitative methods, but also we use qualitative methods as well, as well, interviewing people, focus groups, and how we might look at that kind of data. That's a really important uh, class to have because what you learn there We'll go on to inform what you do in your dissertation in fourth year when you do your own project. Individual differences will concentrate on personality and intelligence. How true are these? What does it tell us about someone to, to have those sorts of um, psychometric test results? And social psychology, how we, uh, how we act in groups, how our attitudes are formed, how they can be changed. The counselling classes are the other half of what you do in third year, and we have three of those as well. 
first one of those is person centered theory, where you'll gain a, a very um, comprehensive understanding of Carol Rogers' theory of development and change. This will let you understand why people change as they engage with counselling and to be able to apply that theory to your own um, observations as you undertake listening skills. The personal development class is the one where we really get together um, in groups and experience one another. What is it like to hear someone whose views are very different from your own? What's coming up for you? Why do you react in a particular way? Can you react in other ways? What does it mean from your past? You are reacting in that particular way. We cover a whole range of topics in that personal development class from spirituality, sexuality, self-care, the ethics of justice and, and social justice. Um, this is a class where students tell us they really change. Uh, they look inwards and sometimes they can see that they do things because it's an expectation from someone else, not something they, they really want to do. Um, this class is, is assessed by reflective essays. So here, when I'm marking those, I get a real insight into what students are telling me about how this class affects them, how they change. And um, without exception, I think everyone changes in significant ways and, and is really appreciative of that. The third class is the counselling skills class. And this is where we will train you to be an active listener. Now that sounds really easy, doesn't it? Listening. Come on, Steve, I've done that since, you know, I was very small. There's a big difference, though, between listening, as you would do with a with friends or a family member, and active listening as, well, not quite a counsellor yet, but as someone who is able to provide active listening skills in a helping role. So I, I sometimes teach these to my clients as well. They can often help where there has been um, arguments within a relationship. They can often help where there is anger coming out um, in relationships. And getting someone to slow down and offer listening skills so that they really try and understand what the other person is saying. I can just slow these things down and help two people really come to an understanding about each other. So I, I thought I'd give you an example here then. Um, if, you, if you imagine yourself in that listening role, okay, I'm going to be your client. Um, what I'd like you to do is just think about what you would say to me at the end of something I'm going to say here just now. How would you kind of want to counsel me or, or show that you've been listening, show that you understand um, what, I've, what I've been through? All right. I'm going to use an example just from my life. I'm going to talk about my daughter who's at university. I'm going to make this a bit larger in life. I'm going to embellish things to make it a little bit more um, significant and to show you um, some points. But just have a think, just listen to what I'm saying. What would you say back to me at the end? So imagine I come along to your counselling practice or listening practice. Oh, I don't know what to do about my daughter. She's, she's 19. She's just started at university. Um, she's always out skateboarding, always out skateboarding with this friend that she's made. And, you know, uh, I'm a dad, I've been through university, I know how hard you've got to work. I'm also a lecturer. I know that you can't just coast and, and leave everything to the end, or you're in real danger of maybe having resets or worse. So I don't know what to do, because she just doesn't listen to me. It's all like, yeah, 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 she'll listen to anyone else, but she won't listen to me. And it's really frustrating really frustrating because I know what I'm talking about. I've done it. I supervise it. Um, yeah, I just know what to do. How might you respond to someone that, that says that sort of thing? Just have them mull over it in your head for a, for a couple of seconds. Let me tell you what, what most people would do before they've trained in counselling skills. They might kind of say something like, yeah, well, so you're a bit worried, but, you know, she'll be all right. Don't worry. Everyone turns out all right. You'll be fine. That sounds really good to do, doesn't it? It kind of shows that you're oh, I'm being sympathetic here and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make you feel better. That's not what we do in active listening. Quite the opposite, in fact. We would never do that. We listen to someone to hear how they are feeling. We don't try and rescue them. We don't try and tell them it'll be all right. We listen to them and say, I hear you're really worried about your daughter. When someone actually feels heard, when someone hears that back, the change in them is palpable. You can see it in their face. 
it's almost like you know, sometimes almost crying. They say, thank you. Someone actually gets what it's like to be me. Another thing you might want to do is say, well, how about if you buy her a textbook or, or, or show her something that, and again, that's something we might do with family or friends. It's not what we do in active listening. It feels so natural to do, but it's not the right thing to do. We don't offer advice as counsellors. People often think we do. We don't, particularly in person-centred approach, because we believe the person speaking to us is the expert in their own lives. So what we might do is simply reflect back what we've heard. So it might go something like this. So you have a 19 year old daughter that's just started university, but you feel she's off doing other things rather than concentrating on her studies. And this worries you because not only you're a parent and you're concerned for her and you've been through university yourself and know what it's like, but you're also a lecturer and you see the students do this. You're not quite sure what to do. That sounds very similar to what I've said, but if someone says that back to me, I trust them. I've been heard. They know where I'm coming from. They're not trying to tell me advice that I've already thought of. And they're not trying to make me uh, feel just better with, yeah, yeah, don't worry, it'll be fine. So that's an example of um, those listening skills that we, that we train in level three. And as you're doing that triad work, you will work with students uh, in, in threes. One will be the speaker, one will be the listener, and you have a third student giving observations on how the listener has done and you swap around those rules. You bring in all your person-centered theory that you've already learned, you bring in all your personal development that you've understood about yourself in the other classes and those three things all join together um, to mean that you can provide that safe supportive atmosphere, showing people empathy rather than sympathy, considering them with what we call unconditional positive regard, really prizing someone for who they are without any judgment and also being true to yourself, understanding what's coming up for you in that role. What does hearing those things raise in you and can you keep that separate from what you're feeling about the person? Um, once all those things come together, that's when you get that cost accredited certificate in counselling skills and that happens at the end of your third year. In level four, the other half of our British Psychological Society core areas are studied. These are cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, and psychobiology. So psychobiology is about the, the workings of brain neurotransmitters, um, you know, the, the electric induction of the brain, the different lobes of the brain, and the, what each part does. Developmental psychology is about development across the, the lifespan. It's, it covers um, old age as well as how children uh, develop. And cognitive psychology views the, the mind as a computer. Um, information processing. Uh, I teach on that, I teach face recognition on that, and we have a, a, a fun um, kind of learning uh, group work experience where uh, you're given a, an eyewitness testimony uh, scenario and you have to advise some lawyers as to what face recognition research tells you about could the eyewitness be accurate or not. So that's one example of, of how we make things um, applicable to real world scenarios as well. It's based on something I did a few years ago for a legal firm in a, in a mugging case. So that's the that's a sort of general introduction to what you're going to experience going on through the course. In fourth year you'll have the chance to do a placement. Um, now the placements themselves uh, can be very varied. Here's an example of some of the placements that our current honours students uh, have got for themselves. It has been a difficult year with COVID because many placement organisations uh, haven't been doing face-to-face -face work. Uh, our, our placements can be done uh, via telephone or online, so that isn't a problem, but it, it, it has been a bit difficult sometimes just uh, finding the placements this year. Hopefully that will be much better next year. And by the time you're in the fourth year, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, some of our students have gone to schools who are work and working there with the children who are, who are having difficulties there. There's an organisation that also provides services for children in school called Place to Be. Some of our students have got placements with that organisation. And here what I hear from our students is uh, they've been very creative in these scenarios. So they may use toys, they may use drawings, asking the child to draw themselves. And then they can ask the child to, well, what, what do you see here? What does that mean for you? So the child can come to a better understanding of who they are and not just what they've been told they are from adults or teachers. 
one student uh, that also comes to mind, uh, she's working for chest, heart and stroke uh, this year in a placement, providing listening services. And, and her comment to me was that felt very different to what we'd been doing in the triad work, because here an awful lot of people just wanted to tell her about how they've gone shopping. And that was initially disappointing. And she looked inside herself. What does that mean for why she disappointed? And then came to realization, this is what these people need. They've had an incredibly traumatic experience where they may have had a, you know, a heart attack or a stroke, a near death experience potentially. They need someone just to, to be with, to, to go back to normal life with and to talk about that. They might not want to talk about that heart attack or stroke. Uh, and that was what she was providing. So that, that continuing self-development really helped her in that role and made her realize that this was just as vital as listening to someone's really traumatic experience. We have another student who is um, undertaking a placement with an organization that supports veterans, people who have been in the army. And some of the tales that, that she's heard um, have been you know, quite, quite horrific. And she's, she's um, experiencing people who may not even want to speak, they are selectively mute, but she provides a presence um, where that's happening. And, and those people feel um, that they are in connection with someone, even if there's no dialogue going on. Another placement is Wellbeing Scotland. I'm actually on the board of directors of Wellbeing Scotland. It's a charity for survivors of domestic and sexual abuse, although they have um, also many mild to moderate mental health services um, that, they, that they offer services for. And some of the students have, have undertaken placements there for people who are not at the, um, the level of trauma that require um, qualified counselling intervention, but do need someone to, to listen to their experience. Those are just some examples of the sorts of placements uh, that you can do in your final year. But uh, from speaking to my students, uh, they found it incredibly rewarding uh, and a, again a huge learning curve. Uh, they'll be well placed to go out into you know, the career world uh, and take these experiences with them. Students can find their own preferred placement. If there's a group that you particularly want to work with, um, you can approach that organisation and as long as they are willing to provide health and safety um, induction for you, as long as they're willing to provide someone there to, to supervise you, a sort of point of contact to write a report at you at the end, they can be a placement organisation. And I've suggested that students can have, um, you know, be quite creative in the sorts of, uh, in the sorts of placements they, they, they want to um, try and get. Care homes, for example, um, I've even suggested asking a veterinary surgery Perhaps people just who have lost a, a pet want someone to talk to about it because they will be grieving, they will be lonely perhaps. So we can be quite creative in these sorts of, of placements. The final year is where you also do your dissertation topic. And this is, this is a hugely exciting piece of work. It's research, it's research that hasn't been done before. Now it doesn't have to be completely um, completely new, it can be just a tiny little tweak or just extending something that's already there out in the literature. But this is where our students really are researchers. We've had some final year students actually publish the work that they've done in their final year dissertation. It becomes your baby and actually one of the students said that I felt this was my baby. I took the idea, I ran with it, it's mine. I know so much about this now. Um, Put up there some examples of the sorts of dissertation topics that our counselling um, students undertook this year. So one is experience of relational depth, sometimes we call this deep empathy, sometimes we call it presence. This feeling that there's just more than just the words, there's some energy going on between us, some real identification with one another, with client and, and counsellor. That's called relational depth and an awful lot of counsellors had to move online very quickly uh, due to COVID. So one of our students uh, asked qualified counsellors to fill in some questionnaires and to supply some answers to questions about their experience of can they still get relational depth if they had to move online from face to face as an emergency response to COVID. And, and she's found that relational depth in the main uh, is more difficult to attain if you've had to do that. Some other ones there, effect of perceived stigma on access to counselling in children. So uh, a dissertation topic that's really focused on child participants and, and working out whether they can feel able to access counselling uh, for mental health issues. Uh, one of my students, uh, she realised that very many people were really on their own during lockdown. If they had no family, if they had no garden, they might have just been in a small one bedroom flat. 
she used qualitative research to try and understand what was their experience of having that enforced upon them. How did they cope? And were there any benefits that came out of that? Another one, another one of my students is very interested in the idea of sexual consent, how people are taught about sexual consent and how this may differ in different communities. So she's looking at understandings of sexual consent in the BDSM and the non-BDSM identifying communities. And she was in touch with one of the, the leading American um, researchers on sexual consent to get his questionnaire permission to use that. And he remarked just how interesting this, uh, this strand of research would be and uh, I guess it's potentially publishable in that sense because it's, it's uh, novel and really needed. Uh, another one we often um, have year on year, I have a PhD student looking at this uh, as well as factors predicting international and home students engagement with the university wellbeing service. We find uh, international students have, uh, have an additional set of considerations in terms of their wellbeing when they come to study in another cult country. Um, they need acculturation, there's so many things they're not used to uh, and not just language barriers. And very often they have higher levels of, of mental wellbeing needs but they are less likely to come forward to the university wellbeing service to seek that help. And so we have several projects that are trying to understand why this might be and how we can help uh, advise wellbeing services as well as international students to, to kind of come together and get that help. Those are quite counselling related um, dissertations. It's a joint honours degree, so psych more psychology uh, related dissertations are equally possible. So in face recognition, attitudes to speaking, uh, speeding, speeding rather, um, anything you can think of being psychology that we can supervise with our staff team, uh, which includes everyone in psychology. Um, I thought I'd also let you see what students say about our course, because I've, I kind of, I love our course, I think it's fantastic, I, I enjoy doing the teaching, um, I love what we do, but I thought I'd let you read what some of our students, I just asked, would anyone like to um, offer something for, for applicant day? This is our final year, this is, this is something they said about their, their thoughts at the end of third year. I won't read them out, but I will just give you a minute to, to read through them. they said there that was my experience of those students as well in the experiential groups um, they they took what we had to offer they made it their own they ran with it uh, and, and, and they really embodied it it was it was wonderful to see um, so these guys are, are about to graduate this year and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing the graduation even if it's just uh, if it just has to be zoom I also thought I'd show you this this is our current third year this was our last session we just did a a question and answer for a third year on what to expect in fourth year about placements about dissertations. We did see them face to face before Christmas but with the new variant of coronavirus we had to keep everything online and so it was Zoom um, that we used uh, for 11 weeks uh, almost all day on a Monday every Monday and this was so touching because at the end of our session uh, they said We'd like the class would like to do something for you, and they just held up all these all these thank you signs. Um, the two blacked out scores you can see they're not third year. They were two fourth year students that we asked to come back and tell the third year about their experience to help them on. But that was really touching, um, and I think demonstrates just the sort of connection we have with our students. Uh, it's a small group, and we work very closely uh, with, with each with each student. So that's all I'm really going to say about the, the, the course, because um, I can't really anticipate what you might be wondering out there uh, and cover everything. So I'm going to stop sharing um, just now and offer answers to any questions that you might have. If you think of any others, uh, my email is steve.kelly at strath.ac.uk. Please do just drop me a, an email as well. Great, thank you very much, um, Steve. That was very informative. Hopefully that gives everyone a nice idea of what they can expect if they decide to join us in September. Um, as I said before, if you'd like to ask a question, then you can do so in the Q&A box. It's just um, along the bottom there. We've had one question come in. 
um, which I'll pose to you just now, but feel free anyone just to keep asking. So Melissa has asked, after graduation, would I be a fully accredited psychotherapist? Can I work as a counsellor? If not, which further qualifications would be needed after completing the degree? Yeah, that's a great question, Melissa. The undergraduate programmes usually don't qualify you to be a, a, a professional psychologist or counsellor. So um, if you want to go on and be a, a counsellor um, in, in the way that I trained, uh, what you need to do is either do a one year master's course or a two year part time postgraduate diploma or master's. The COSCA certificate in counselling skills is the usual qualification that you need to get onto that. Now that doesn't involve any, you know, people without a psychology degree can go on to train to be a counsellor. And so on my course, there were people from social work, there were nurses, uh, there were teachers. Counselling is a very wide range. I felt I had a bit of an advantage knowing a lot about psychology, but you certainly don't need that. Um, with the joint honours degree, you will have that advantage if you want to train to be a counsellor. You can also go on to train to be a professional psychologist after this. Now that's things like forensic psychology, sports psychology, um, clinical psychology is the one that uh, a lot of people want to do. Those are usually two or three year masters or doctorate courses. It's a long time to have to study after doing a four year degree to then go on to do a, a one, two or three year masters course to get um, these qualifications, but that is the route. And of course, the, where these two things really come together is in counselling psychology. So you can go on to train to be a counselling psychologist. That's a three year degree. And uh, you, you have to specialise in two areas, perhaps person-centred in CBT or person-centred in psychodynamic. Um, and that involves a, a doctoral level dissertation as well. So there's various routes that you can go through. Uh, they're all different. They all require different amounts of time. They're different levels of qualification. But you do need postgraduate work after your degree, whatever you want to do, if it involves seeing clients or patients. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've got a question. Can I stay on the BA programme if I decide to switch to single honours psychology? Uh, yes, yeah, you can. Um, in the first year, if you get accepted onto the BSc, that's you on the BSc programme. At the end of first year, you can opt to switch onto the BA and do single honour psychology, or in fact, joint honours. One of those two subjects that you do in the first year, you might actually think, do you know what? I quite like doing this. I'm going to stay on and take that further. So you can switch from the BSc to the BA at the end of first year. You can also do it at the end of second year. Technically, you can do it at the end of third year as well, but it, it, that's a rather complicated route because that doesn't give you British Psychological Society recognition because you won't have done all the subjects at level three that you need to. Um, we can do that on the BSc because we put those in in fourth year. The fourth year honours curriculum doesn't let you do that. But generally speaking, at the end of first year or second year, if you decide, actually, I don't want to do counselling, I want to do single honours psychology, you can swap over. Equally, we get some people on the BA psychology at the end of first year, they say, can we please come on the BSc? Because actually, the counselling stuff looks really interesting and, and, and I'd like to do that. So we can accommodate some people in that direction but it's a very small course, 20 to 30 students, 30 maximum. Um, whereas on the BA, you can, in any number can, can move uh, onto the BA because we've got, you know, 500 in first year, 200 in, in second year on the BA. Okay, there was another question that asked how many other subjects can I pick in year one if I'm studying psychology? But I think um, you, you answered that in your last question there. We've got another question that says, can I get a conditional place on a master's counselling programme if I am a student on the BSc programme? Do I need to stay on until honours to qualify? Okay, so you have to undertake an interview to get on our master's uh, at Strathclyde. Um, and being on the BSc doesn't um, guarantee you a, a conditional place or an unconditional place on that, on that course. You have to go through the interview uh, the same as anyone who hadn't done the BSc. What I would say is that we work really closely with our colleagues on the master's course. They know what our course teaches. Um, they know the, the, the skills that our students um, acquire. So I think personally that our students are really well placed um, to get on that course. 
because we emphasize person-centered psychotherapy. The master's course at Strathclyde is person-centered. In fact, Strathclyde for decades and decades has been one of the internationally renowned places for person-centered psychotherapy. We had Dave Mearns here, we had Mick Cooper here, Robert Elliott is just retiring this year. These are huge, huge names um, from, the, from the history of Strathclyde and, and psychotherapy. Do you need to stay on until honours to qualify? To get on a master's course, yes, because normally a master's course requires you to have an honours level degree. And actually it's at Strathclyde, you need to get a 2-1 degree or above to get on the master's course. That's not the case for all courses. And in fact, I didn't train as a psychotherapist at Strathclyde. I thought that was a little bit too close to home. I trained with a private organisation called Persona. Persona only require you to have the COSCA certificate in counselling skills. So I was training alongside people who were not degree qualified. Some people had HNCs, HNDs, um, but many people did not have that, that level of academic um, experience that I had. So there you could actually, if you wanted to, leave at the end of level three and go and train with Persona uh, to be a counsellor. You do have to stay on and do your, your degree if you want to um, train to be any sort of psychologist because it's only at the end of level four that you get the graduate basis for chartered registration with the British Psychological Society. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think that's all of our questions just now. We can give it a wee minute just in case anyone wants to, to ask mm -hmm. anything before we go. Um, but hopefully that was, we answered everyone's questions there so far. And like um, Steve said, if you've got any other questions after you leave the webinar today, you can absolutely get in touch beyond that and we'll be happy to help. Oh, here's another one. How many students are in a psychology class in year one? Yeah, there's lots. And the reason for there being lots is Scotland has this baccalaureate system. So where you, if you want to come in and do psychology, you will do psychology in two other subjects. We've also got people that have no interest in psychology in second, third and fourth year, but they come in to do law and they have to choose two other subjects. So they might go, oh, psychology seems a bit interesting. So, so we've got usually between 400 and 500 students in first year. Usually only about 200 of those, 250 of those will go on to second year and there they're doing two subjects, remember. Usually only about 120 odd go on to third year it, it, to do psychology. So each year we, we find there's, there's fewer and fewer people because um, each student is doing a mix of different subjects and it's not necessarily psychology is their principal one that they want to do. Now, first year psychology, we're in the biggest lecture theatre. It's, it's actually quite fun. Um, I, I love doing the first year lectures because you can, you can still keep it interactive, even with that many people. You get a whole range of different views. I talk about phobias. Um, I talk about how people might have been trained uh, as, as children by their parents using you know, learning principles. Um, but we also have tutorials in first year as well, so for more small group work. Because 500 students, yes, it can be very intimidating um, to, to interact there. So we've got uh, some small group tutorials in first year where you can you know, be, in, be in smaller groups. That's great. I was um, I studied psychology in my first three years at Strathclyde, so I was actually a student at the business school. Yeah. Um, but uh, psychology was my elective, so I remember those very large lecture rooms but it was it was it was a great atmosphere and you got to hear lots of questions from different people things that maybe you hadn't thought about during that lecture so it can be a good fun atmosphere and then you've got the the contrast of the tutorial later in that week and um, we've got another question from Melissa are there any scholarship opportunities for counselling and psychology course and can you speak about the labs available to students on the course well there's a couple of questions within this and are there children family friendly spaces on campus? Okay, thanks Melissa. Um, scholarships. I don't think there are undergraduate scholarships, but Leah, you might be able to correct me on that. Yeah, so it depends where you're from, Melissa. It would depend on your fee status. Um, if you are an international student, we have an undergraduate 
um, scholarship, but I can post you a link to that. I'll find it when Steve picks up on other points about the labs, I'll find it and I'll post it to you. Um, so yes, you can get a scholarship if you're an international student. If, of course, you're a Scottish student, you can apply for funding from SAS, the Students Awards Agency for Scotland. I don't want to bog down anyone on lots of information about that, but I'd be happy to um, email you beyond there. Once I can figure out what your fee status is, I can check what's available to you and help you find um, financial help from there. Um, if you want to talk about the labs, then I will find the links for Melissa. So the, the, the labs, um, we, have, we have very specialised labs, which students often use in, in final year. Most of our studies are done via computer labs, um, so we can run experiments using programmes like E-Prime, um, or on computers, and that lets us present stimuli, take reaction times, that sort of thing. Um, you know, everything's done on a computer nowadays. It's a very different time from when I was an undergraduate at Edinburgh. We had, you know, tachistoscopes, which were mirrors and a little button and a, a flap that made you, uh, allowed you to present things very quickly. So we've got very large computer labs where we will train you to set up experiments, get you to experience experiments um, as participants, and to train you how to analyse the uh, results using statistical tests using a programme called SPSS. So. That, that's the sort of lab status in the first few years. By the time you get to final year, you can obviously still use a computer to design and, and present um, your face stimuli or, or questionnaires, that sort of thing. All of our students Qualtrics account, which is a professional questionnaire management system. Um, but we also have very specialist laboratories like a driving simulator. We've got um, uh, 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 infrared cameras which can uh, measure motion. You, will, you stick little silver balls to someone and uh, the infrared cameras pick up where they're moving their bodies. We've got EEG facilities. Um, I use electrophysiology, heart rate, skin conductance uh, to do some of, some of my work. Um, we've got memory labs. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole range of, of different um, uh, sort of facilities and kit available to students. Um, eye tracking as well, one of my colleagues uh, can train you up into how to eye track someone using various stimuli and that can have huge implications for you know website design as well as understanding our attentional systems and what people might be drawn to. People who have depression tend to get drawn to um, sad or worrying type stimuli for example and you can track where their eyes are going with this kind of um, equipment. So these are all possible to use by the time you get to your final year. And the final question, are there children or family friendly spaces on campus? Um, the campus, it's a city centre campus, but there's some wonderful green spaces uh, around about it. Rotten Row Gardens is right in the middle of, of the campus. If anyone has small children, there's a nursery on campus. My own daughter went there, it was wonderful, um, right in the middle of campus um, uh, and really handy. Um, does that answer your question about children and family friendly spaces? I mean, we've got a new learning and teaching building, which is a bright, airy, open, there's cafes in there, uh, lots of places to chill out on campus and, and coffee shops spaced around um, in, the different, in the different buildings. And you've got the whole centre of Glasgow as well, of course. Um, for, for Absolutely, we're not far from Glasgow Green or mm -hmm. right away to Kelvin Grove, etc. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, I've posted a couple of links about SAS funding um, and because you mentioned children, Melissa, I wonder if you, you've, you've got a child to have um, posted a link to the childcare fund that Strathclyde have, um, so you can have a look at that link if that might help um, you during your studies. Um, oh, okay, we've got another question. What are the topics you can choose from in first year? Oh, that's taxing my memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfair. I'm an old man. Um, okay, it, I think we've got sort of law, education, English, politics, history, languages. Have I said law? <laughs> 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 if you look on the on the prospectus, there'll be a, a full grid of all the different things you can take. That's that's a that's a sample of them. Um, a lot of these things you won't have. Uh, experience of at school, like law or politics, probably haven't been taught that at school. In fact, in Scotland, a lot of people don't get taught psychology at school. So this is a chance to really dip your toes in the water. If you're not sure, if there's something you think, oh, am I like that? I don't know. It's, you know, it's first year level um, stuff. Uh, give, it, give it a whirl. Try and find something you enjoy. 
lots of the, the subjects will complement each other as well. So there'll be lots of elements of psychology in other other subjects or where you can bring knowledge from other subjects into this. So sometimes that's what makes these um, our degrees so, so interesting and um, give them a bit more character maybe or broad a broad sense of learning than than on their other degrees absolutely yeah there's, there's so many um things that psychology interplays with i mean we do research with people in english with people in politics there, there's a big crossover and, and one of my students actually who was just going is just going into second year on the bsc you know would say he loves spanish can you please still take spanish and i have to say no because we have a set curriculum on the bsc but do contact the Spanish department and they might give you stuff to do. They won't sit you and examine it, but um, they might give you some, some um, Spanish learning. Absolutely. Um, I think that's all of our questions then. Um, so unless anyone wants to slide anything in their last minute, um, but of course you can email us later if you, you have any further questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and we hope to see some of you in September. Yeah, thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Bye.